Hello again, welcome to part 2 of the Arctic Amplification series. Quick refresher, Arctic Amplification is the process by which the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the globe. Last time we covered three feedback loops that contribute to Arctic Amplification, namely the Planck feedback, the Isolbido feedback, and the Lapstrate feedback. Speaking of which, I realized only after uploading the last video that I forgot to tell you something pretty fundamental in it which is that the lapse rate feedback is named after the lapse rate, which just signifies how temperature falls with altitude. I will encourage you to watch the first part of the video, uh, link in the top right corner, if you need a more detailed refresher. This video will be discussing what Arctic amplification means for the planet. And next video will discuss what that means for us. Originally, all of this was planned as one video, then two videos and now three videos, to not make any one video too long and exhausting, I do think this is a good idea for the long run. Since I showed you three causes last time, I'll show you three resulting effects of Arctic amplification this time. First up, let's look at the oceans. In the Arctic, oceans are covered in sea ice, but as we established in the last video, sea ice is melting. And though this completely destroys the polar bear's natural habitat and increases warming due to the ice albedo effect, <clears throat> see part one to know what that is, Sea ice melting leads to no rise in sea level. Why? Because when you get cold enough weather, the top layer of the water freezes, giving you sea ice. That same water melting just brings the water level back up to what it was without any overall change. Thank goodness there is no land ice in the Arctic, right? Oh, but wait, there is, and Greenland is covered in it. Since most of Greenland is within the Arctic Circle, which is an imaginary line that essentially dictates what general area is considered to be the Arctic, a warmer Arctic results in a Greenland with less ice. And that does lead to sea level rise. Now unfortunately, that's not where the story ends. But to cover what's coming next, we first got to cover some oceanography basics. The Northern Atlantic Ocean is an essential part of the thermohaline circulation which comes from thermo, referring to temperature, and haline, referring to salinity. Thermo you probably saw coming, but why does haline mean salty? Well, because that, which should roughly sound like hus, means salt in ancient Greek. And boy, do scientists like Latin and Greek root words. Thus, the name thermohaline circulation actually explains what the concept means the movement or circulation of water due to temperature and salinity changes, which, by the way, connects every ocean on our planet. And this is where I stop explaining long and complicated words mostly oceanographers use. Just kidding, here's another one. The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. Atlantic because it's the Atlantic Ocean, Meridional because it deals with north to south and south to north movement, and because a meridian is a line of constant longitude encircling the Earth. Overturning for reasons I'll explain in a minute, and circulation because again the water is circulating. Okay, I'm done, I promise. So how does Amok work? And why does it contain the word overturning? It all starts with equatorial water in the Gulf of Mexico. This easygoing water mass or water parcel, let's call him Walter for example's sake, has two things going for him. He's warm and he's salty. With the thermohaline circulation pushing it along, as well as wind stress imparted by the atmosphere, Walter travels from south to north. And with gradual evaporation along his journey, Walter gets even saltier. With decreasing temperature on his northward journey, he's also cold now, kind of like the water masses that are already there. But unlike Susan and Jill, Walter is salty in addition to being cold, so his density goes through the roof, allowing him to sink down and be on his merry way back southward. To summarize, surface water goes north, deep water goes south, and an overturning occurs when the surface current sinks at northern latitudes to form a southward flowing deep current. And this all happens because of differences in temperature as well as salinity. Because thermohaline, you remember? Okay, good. Now let's go back to the story of Greenland. As we established, Greenland is melting. As it's melting, the fresh meltwater is entering the Atlantic Ocean. The fresh water mass, let's call him Philip with a neph, is a bit of a problem. So remember that salinity was a huge factor in the overturning process, the O in Amok? 
Well now, the surface water freshens along its journey, more so than gets saltier, leading to a fresher water mass. And let's quickly backtrack why all this is happening and touch upon why Greenland is melting. Because it's warmer due to global warming, which means the surface waters are also warmer, and so we end up with a warmer, fresher water mass trying to overturn or sink. And understandably, it's a little bit harder. So the whole circulation system, amok, if you're keeping track, slows down. You might be guessing that's probably bad, and you'd be right, but you'll have to wait for the next video to find out why. Second in our agenda, we got how Arctic amplification impacts land. Remember the Arctic Circle? Well, a little north and a little south of it, we got plenty of land, and all the northerly land contains permafrost. Now, what is permafrost? Permafrost can be rock, soil, or sediment, but in addition to all that, it contains carbon-rich plant remains and carbon-rich animal remains. Carbon-rich just means with a lot of carbon, which all life on this planet is. That's why we're called carbon-based life forms. But I digress. The last and most important quality of permafrost is that it's frozen, hence the frost in permafrost. The perma bit, which implies permanently frozen, is what's questionable at this point. With Arctic amplification, land masses in the near vicinity of the Arctic Ocean, which we establish as mostly permafrost, are thawing. Within the permafrost, there are microbes. Most of these microbes are in a fascinating state somewhere between life and death that is beyond the scope of this video, but do check out my resources if you want to learn more about this strange microbe voodoo magic. They are in this weird state because permafrost is frozen, but as it thaws, these half-dead zombie microbes spring back to life, look for food, and start munching. And as they munch, they degrade the carbon-rich plant and animal remains that thawed along with them and release greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide and methane. And the warmer it gets, the faster they munch, which in turn means more of the carbon that's within the ground gets released to the atmosphere. The warming, as we know, is primarily facilitated by the carbon that's already in the atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases, keeping in the outgoing longwave radiation. Permafrost, as we established, also contains carbon, which due to increased temperatures is slowly seeping out. And most importantly, it's twice as much as the atmospheric carbon. The implications of this, I'm sure you've guessed yourselves, but again, we'll talk about what that means for us in the next video. The third and last thing on our agenda is how Arctic amplification impacts the atmosphere. Here we have a lot to cover, so bear with me and forgive me for skipping over some details that we simply don't have the time for. Straight off the bat, I'm not going to spend much time on atmospheric cells and just tell you that in the northern hemisphere, there's air above the mid-latitudes that is relatively warm, and air above the north pole that is really, really cold. Now let's zoom in and check the side view. Air as we know it, or the atmosphere, is just a bunch of gas molecules indicated in the schematic as dots. Blue dots are called polar air molecules, and red dots are warmer mid-latitude air molecules. Gas molecules, as we established in the last video, when heated, knock into each other more than when they are cold. This means they take up more space or volume when warm. So, although in the schematic the warm air column is taller than the colder air column, pressure A that the warm air exerts and pressure B that the cold air exerts are equal because both columns have roughly the same amount of gas molecules. And no, that doesn't mean count every molecule. Obviously, I did not count every dot when drawing the schematic. Anyhow, we can visualize this difference in height with an isobar, which is a line of equal pressure. So along this line, the pressure is the same. In other words, if there's more molecules above, which there definitely are since we're just in the lower atmosphere here, they exert the same pressure in each column, despite the differences in column height. But what I want you to focus on is that the tall warm column and the cold squished column exerts roughly the same pressure at the surface, so the isopar at the surface is flat. Focusing on our two columns again, long story short, the pressure gradient force is from the warmer air towards the colder air. A what now? The pressure gradient force, quite literally the force that is caused by the difference in pressure. If a place has high pressure, it is essentially pushing you away, and if you don't resist, you'll end up in a place that has the lowest pressure. Intuitively, you can think of it as a slide where air parcels simply take the slide from an area of high pressure to low pressure, but keep in mind this is technically wrong 
because the air is mostly seeping in from the same height or altitude, not from a higher one, because that is actually where the pressure difference exists and not the line of equal pressure. You're still with me? Okay, good. Because we're about to get even more complicated. So let's zoom out again and let's look at the top down view. The earth spins from west to east, but the earth is a sphere. So that means different parts of it rotate at different speeds. And this results in pseudo forces. Pseudo forces, really? Why couldn't the earth just be a cylinder where every point on the surface was equal distance away from the axis of rotation? Then we wouldn't have these pretend forces. But alas, we do. And this means any air parcel traveling northward is drawn to the east in the northern hemisphere. And this is because of Newton's first law. Simply put, if our air parcel was moving at the speed the Earth's surface revolves around the axis of rotation at lower latitudes, despite going to a higher latitude, that speed will be conserved. In other words, every old air parcel keeps her eastward speed, which is larger than the eastward speed of the surface at her new latitude. I hope you haven't forgotten about our good old friend, the pressure gradient force, that goes from warm air to cold air, indicated here by the red and blue colors, respectively. That's the whole reason Ariel went northward in the first place. Notice how both the arrows are the same green, get it? Okay, good. So to summarize, the color scheme is green for pressure gradient, orange for Coriolis, which is what we just described as the pseudo force that pushes northward moving things to the east, and if you remember, yellow was simply indicating the rotation of the Earth. Now let's add a new color, dark red, for geostrophic flow. Geostrophic flow is the balance between Coriolis force in orange and the pressure gradient force in green. Once Coriolis deflects the flow of air, or aerial's journey in this case, eastward, there it shall remain because pressure gradient will stay generally northward due to the difference in air temperature and Coriolis will now point southward because it always deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere. Why does Coriolis also deflect to the right on lines of equal latitude? Most researchers now agree that this is because of extraterrestrial activity that is influencing the phenomenon, but... Jaskin, it's actually due to centripetal and centrifugal forces that would take quite some time to explain. But I encourage you to look them up or request that I make a video on Coriolis in the future in which I can also teach you why Coriolis is not a real force. Speaking of equal latitude, I technically lied to you with this diagram. The globe isn't just segmented by a straight line that says warm is south and cold is north, but due to differences in the amount of time different surfaces like land, ice, and ocean take to warm up and cool down, we got different areas on the same latitude that are different in air temperature which, as you might have guessed based on our lengthy discussion, just means that our straight geostrophic flow is in reality curvy. And finally, now that we've explained how he works, ladies and gentlemen, say hello to the jet stream. And now that we've spent half the video till now describing what the heck he is, we can finally answer how Arctic amplification affects him. So the basic idea is this. As the Arctic gets warmer, the difference in temperature between the Arctic and the middle latitudes gets smaller. Remember our technically wrong but intuitive explanation of air sliding down the isobar slide? Well, the force is smaller, so the air is transported slower. What does that mean? The jet stream slows down and as a result meanders more, causing all sorts of weather calamities by dragging cold weather from the north and warm weather from the south and blah 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 all of which we will touch upon in the next video. A long story short, Arctic amplification makes the jet stream wavier. Or at least that's what I'd like to tell you with 100% certainty. Not because it's what I want, but because that's what research has shown. But there's also research that says otherwise. So what does this mean? Climate science is wrong and all the predictions it makes are nonsense. No. It means that the jet stream and arctic amplification, or at the very least global warming, are indeed connected. We just don't know how yet. The dissection of all papers for and against arctic amplification driven jet stream meandering is a video for another time. That will easily take up 10 minutes or more on its own. But for now, I would just like to leave you with the idea that just because climate scientists don't agree on something doesn't mean we're all wrong. The pursuit of scientific knowledge is hard, and often in the search for truth, we argue. But these arguments are what push us forward and make sure what we claim to be true is indeed true. 
So if anything, all this uncertainty that is making hundreds of researchers all across the globe argue and therefore repeatedly investigate the same phenomenon should comfort you knowing that experts in the field are doing their best to understand the reality of the situation. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching my video till the very end, encourage you to subscribe, and encourage you to hit that notification bell. Last but not least, if you enjoyed the company of Walter the Watermass, Ariel the Air Parcel, and me, the Half-Drawn Man, your host, well then don't forget to leave a like. If you haven't watched the video uh, that explains why there's arctic amplification in the first place, you can find the link here. And since we talked about the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, I would heavily recommend you some of the work on the topic by Shukuro Manabe, a climate scientist who recently won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Check out the video on why he won it here.